Okay, um, I'm ready. Uh, we are live now. We can start as soon as everyone is ready. Hello. Achu, I'm here. I should hear. Are you here? Um, one moment, Achu. I'll just check. It made her admin. Achu, I'm here. Yeah. I. Yes, Professor Basil, uh, we are just waiting for the moderator to join in. Okay, sure. Um, there might be a slight uh, audio delay. Uh, that's the sense I got. Professor uh, Drishti? Oh, yeah, it seems okay on my end. I believe she's joined from Purnima's account. Yeah, yeah, she's there. Yeah. Now. She's Good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible now, Purnima. I mean, I should, yeah. You can go ahead now. Okay, sir. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together, says Vincent van Gogh. A very good evening to all the attendees, esteemed faculty members and research scholars have joined us. It gives us immense pleasure to welcome you all to Writing Worlds, Worlds Writing, New Textualities and their Online Lights, a national conference organized by the Department of English at St. Joseph's University, Bangalore. The conference attempts to initiate discussions and debates on the changing nature of textual practices and their contemporary relevance. Our week-long conference will be conducted on hybrid mode. The first three days, the sessions will be conducted on online mode. And from 23rd March to 25th, the paper and poster presentations, plenary sessions, workshops, and installations will be conducted offline. Our conference aims to discuss and debate the intertextual and metatextual configurations of new media, their immersive and interactive foundation, and raises relevant questions about how the writer, producer, reader accesses are reformulated in the current context. And today, day one of a national conference is going to be kick-started by a live session on post-humanism. And it gives me great pleasure the English University, ASA. Dr. Bastel completed his master's and doctoral degrees from the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. Dr. Bastel has published in national and international journals and authored four books. His research interests lie primarily in carceral narratives from India, digital cultures, and English writing from Northeast India. We are very pleased to have you, sir, and us today. And we're also very grateful that you are going to start a live session, our national conference, day one of our national conference. So we'll deliver a talk on the topic, post-humanism and its contestations, some critical approaches. The present lecture will aim to explore its contingent and tentatively formed interdisciplinary boundaries, highlighting its overlap across many fields of interest, including those on nature, animals, and technology, as well as in narrative. The lecture will try to connect these to a diversity of thought and show how post-human forms are culturally embedded. So before we move on to the session, I would like to gently remind all our attendees who have joined us today to stay with us till the end of the session. And please do not forget to post your queries, if any, in the chat box and in the live chat stream on YouTube, only during the question answer session at the end of the presentation. 
So without any further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Basil for the session. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it gives me great pleasure and it is indeed my privilege to be part of this, uh, of this program. Um, I hope my voice is coming through. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's fine. All right. Yeah. Uh, if there's any uh, technical issue, uh, do let me know. Um, uh, yes. So. plenary session, I'll admit uh, at the outset is going to be uh, uh, on the lines of a very simple talk actually. And uh, I humbly appeal uh, my esteemed colleagues uh, as well as the students to accommodate any mistakes or omissions that might have crept in. Um, that being said, uh, I just want to say that this topic has been of interest to me for some time, uh, given the uh, the you know the entrenched uh, technological uh, experiences that we are having currently, and uh, so there are concerns and questions which have arisen out of our relationship with technology and the virtual world or the digital world, and this has come to shape our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of this category of the human, and that is where the uh, the talks title also is derived from this post-humanism that we are about to sort of explore together. Uh, I'll just try to share my screen. Uh, just let me know if it's coming through. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to start my uh, talk with a picture, um, which I found very interesting. Right, uh, this is an image called, interestingly, it's called Peoples of the World. <laughs> it's by this uh, 16th century uh, German geographer and uh, cosmographer called Sebastian Munster, right? And you can see here, uh, even in the 16th century, uh, this depiction of the peoples of the world, quote unquote, right? Uh, the idea of the human is already being challenged even from that point of time. Um, we have these strange uh, human animal hybrids and uh, limbs and torsos out of proportion, right? So it's a very interesting depiction of how Munster was imagining the people of the world from different parts of the world. And this is uh, very different from, let's say, this image. I think most of the students might be uh, already quite aware of what this image represents, right? Uh, this is called the Vitruvian man, right? And the Vitruvian man uh, basically is Leonardo da Vinci's ideal human being. Um, and it has come to represent uh, this sort of proportional human being at the center of uh, rational and cosmic thinking, right? So you have the circle and the square and this human male figure uh, in a proportionate way encased within the circle and the square. So it's a, it's a very prominent example of Renaissance thought uh, with regards to uh, how the human is perceived, okay? And similarly, uh, around uh, the same time, we also have 
Michael Angelo's statue of David. And he began sculpting David around the year 1501. Uh, that's almost uh, more than 500 years ago, right? And he completed it three years later. And you can see he carved the statue naked. Uh, and this style took inspiration from uh, ancient Greek and Roman statues, especially of the, their gods, the classical gods uh, from ancient Greece and Rome. For example, we see here, uh, and this, uh, this is either Zeus or Poseidon, it's not very clear. Uh, these Greek gods were cast as men. And these uh, examples can be dated back to somewhere around the fifth century BCE. So almost 2,500 years ago. And uh, we also have another example, such as this statue of Apollo, again from the fifth century BC. And if you notice carefully, the statue of Apollo looks suspiciously close to the design and the proportions of the statue of David, right? So the inspiration from antiquity is very clear during the Renaissance period. And we also have another example called, and this is a bronze statue called Man with Helmet. And this statuette was found in 1972 uh, near the Italian coast. And again, this is traced back to the fifth century BCE. So the reason why I'm sharing these images of these statues is to impress upon you, all the students who are here, this idea of the proportional and aesthetic human being, right? The Greeks had a very particular idea of uh, what constituted beauty, right? And our humanities and our humanist thinking, where we place the human being, the proportionate and aesthetic human being at the center of our thinking, it kind of can be traced back to the Greek humanists as well, right? So you can see this beautiful and proportional human being or human form, uh, which is embedded in classical Western representations, right? And this is the uh, kind of representation which sort of inspired later artists, realistic depictions of the human form. But if we recall Munster's drawing, right? Uh, even during the Renaissance period, there was already this, uh, uh, this countercurrent of trying to challenge what human means, right? Especially in terms of its representation in painting, in literature, uh, even in superstitious beliefs or in folklore, right? So the term posthumanism, uh, it can be traced back to this humanist tradition, right? It comes from this determinant word called humanism. And here it'll be useful to clarify that uh, post-humanist or post-humanities, uh, which are used concurrently, they're a bit different from the word post-human itself. Uh, post-humanities, it uh, kind of denotes humanist thought, like I mentioned, and this can be uh, traced back to before the formalization of the humanities in our universities and in our colleges. Um, and we also have to, uh, be mindful that uh, post-humanist perspectives that we are going to discuss, they sort of coincide with uh, anti-theoretical positions that have uh, emerged in the last three or four decades. Um, uh, so there are different post-humanisms that we have to think about. Uh, already it's getting a little complicated, but uh, I'll try to simplify things as best as I can. Uh, so. The main thing is that there is a critique of the conception of what it means to be human, right? Quote, unquote, this category of human that we see in art, that we see in philosophy, at the center of the sciences, and you know, in the center of the world and the universe, so to speak. So humanist notions of the human, uh, which we saw with our statues, they insert a particular ideology in our political and artistic thinking, right? And this was made even more concrete during the Renaissance, uh, where, uh, you know, there was this emphasis on the supremacy of the human man over categories such as nature, but more particularly, the supremacy of the Western or European man over the world and over nature. And this positioning uh, sort of uh, gave 
a privileged status to the human being. So basically the questioning rational or moral human being or moral human individual, he became the center of Western thinking during the Renaissance period. I'm generalizing a little bit, of course, uh, just to make things a bit uh, simpler for us. Um, even then, uh, there are contestations which began during that point of time, right? And that is something that I also wanted to trace back a little bit through some simple examples. So take, for example, our character here, Batman. Everyone knows Bruce Wayne and Batman, right? And uh, Batman, as we know, as a character, uh, as recognizable as the character is, combines certain features and attributes, right? Such as uh, operating chiefly at night, uh, combining qualities such as stealth and, uh, uh, you know, deductive capabilities as a detective, even martial arts. So perfect mind, perfect body kind of character. And he's popular in movies, as you can see this uh, uh, portrayal by Robert Pattinson in the recent movie. He's been portrayed as uh, a cartoon in comics, in PC or console gaming. And in the recent decade or so, Batman has also been made into different kinds of memes. So Batman is uh, very popular in our culture, right? Um, and But if we trace back the character itself, if we try to historicize this character a little bit, um, it's hard to believe that Batman was actually created all the way back in the year 1939, the beginning of World War II, right? Uh, by this artist called Bob Kane. And the original writer was named Bill Finger. So Batman, or you know, look at the word, man as bat, uh, the character itself is not a new thing. It's not a new conception. You might already be thinking, oh, Batman reminds you of, let's say, bat-like uh, human forms, such as the vampire, right? So we have, in many European folklore, stories of uh, you know, vampire-like creatures or malevolent or bad spirits that prey on human beings and consume their blood. So the man-bat image and depictions of such a combination, right? Uh, it could be argued comes from the vampire myths, for example, right? So uh, just moving on to the next slide, we have the author, Bram Stoker, Abraham Stoker, right? He wrote the Gothic novel Dracula, uh, which was published uh, in 1897. And Dracula is considered one of the most popular literary works, English literary works, to talk about the vampire legend. And his work started off uh, or spawned an entire genre of uh, literature and film later on. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, if we think about the cover art for his novel, we see a particular kind of uh, illustration which is depicted here. This was done by an artist by the name of Edgar Alfred Holloway. And this was for a particular uh, uh, edition of uh, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is popular in the early 1900s. And you can see this figure, right? Uh, this Batman-like figure clambering the side of a building, right? Possibly scaling its walls, just like Batman. And he's also dressed in a dark robe, uh, just like Batman. And you can see bat-like wings, uh, you know, uh, behind him. And this inspiration for uh, Stoker, Batman, right? The vampire figure is also traced back to nature, interestingly. Uh, we have this uh, description from chapter 12 of the novel uh, in an entry named Dr. Seward's Diary. And we have this description, and I'll, I'll just read it out. It's a short description. I have not seen anything pulled down so quick since I was on the pampas and had a mare that I was fond of go to grass all in a night. One of those big bats, and this is referring to the vampire bat, that they call vampires had got at her in the night. And what with his gorge and the vein left open, there wasn't enough blood in her to let her stand up. And I had to put a bullet through her as she lay, close quote. So you can see the Batman figure, the Dracula figure, all were inspired from nature originally. Even Stoker mentions it. And of course, we have a more modern illustration 
uh, but uh, paradoxically, it's an it's an old fashioned style. Uh, this illustration by the artist John Coulthard. So this is a modern depiction, but uh, the style is from the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so you can see Dracula as a bat, literally, right? And uh, what's more interesting is that Stoker's Dracula is not the first popular depiction of the vampire figure, right? Um, in the 1840s, there were a series of pamphlet prints, which were very popular in London. And uh, they carried a character called Varney the Vampire. And the full title of these pamphlets was Varney the Vampire or the Feast of Blood. So one of the earliest examples of uh, the vampire in English literature uh, can be traced further back before Stoker's Dracula. And this was by a writer by the name of James Malcolm Reimer. And moving further back, even before Varney the Vampire, we have a depiction of a humanoid bat sucking on blood, which can be traced back to uh, a work by this Spanish painter and printmaker called Francisco Goya, right? He was born in 1746. And in the, in the 1820s, you know, this is just after uh, the, uh, you know, the disastrous campaign by Napoleon and of course the end of his campaign in Europe. Uh, he had a print called The Disasters of War. And this is a very interesting depiction. We can see uh, this gigantic bat-like creature extracting what can only be presumed to be the blood of its victim here. So you can see how this bat-man hybrid can be traced quite a while back, right? Uh, and the point of comparing these different images from different points of time is to try to share with you the idea that uh, uh, post-human thinking or post-human representation can be traced back uh, before its emergence as, a, as an academic category or part of the curriculum of the university or part of the syllabus of our uh, humanities. Right, so it, that is an important point to keep in mind when thinking about post-humanities, that it's not exactly new. This vein of, uh, you know, sort of questioning the human ideals was already present in the culture. So the transition of Batman from this to this, to Varney the Vampire and onward down to Dracula, this is very much a product of our post-human imagination. Uh, that is, you know, our ability to sort of locate human forms and uh, personify things and objects in ways that relate to the human. So our ideal projection, the ideal projections of the human, as we saw in the statues, um, you know, as concretely as a head or a torso or two arms, two legs, and these different Batman we can see they all represent different kinds of, different ways of thinking or conceptualizing the human, right? But coming back to our root word, post-humanisms in the plural, it's actually uh, more useful to think of post-humanisms, right? Uh, basically, post-humanism is a number of critical, cultural, and philosophical uh, uh, ways of looking at uh, the human. Um, and some of these uh, sort of isms I'll be touching upon very briefly now, and also trying to sort of uh, differentiate post-humanism from different kinds of isms as well. Uh, right, so one of the first isms that we have to deal with uh, to differentiate post-humanism uh, from other kinds of thoughts, which also talk about human and the way humans have been sort of uh, enmeshed in in you know, different technological innovations. One of the first isms we have to deal with is called transhumanism. And I think again, transhumanisms would be a better word to fall back upon. And this uh, uh, way of thinking basically relates uh, humans and technology directly, right? And there's an interesting claim at the heart of transhumanism. The claim is that humans and technology share a symbiotic relationship. That means our relationship is for the good and for the good of all mankind. So it has a utilitarian sort of basis. And transhumanist thought 
uh, is conceived along the lines of individual rights and entitlements. Okay, so in a way, transhumanism extends the humanist liberal ideals, right, which uh, sort of became center of the humanities in the 1920s and 30s when English literature was first starting out. And uh, but there's a problem here because post-humanist thinking critiques this idea, right? Uh, for example, we have this thinker by the name of Joel Garou. And Garou says that transhumanism is basically the enhancement of the intellectual, physical, and emotional capabilities of human beings by uh, uh, adopting technology wholeheartedly, right? So this can be anywhere uh, from uh, biotechnology to modify seeds, to increase uh, crop productivity, or uh, the adoption of robotic prosthetics for people who are uh, physically uh, different, right? Uh, but of course, transhumanism also has its roots in, uh, uh, in the ideas and ideals of the humanities. Basically, what are these pillars of uh, the humanities, right? Uh, the privileging of rationality, agency, and if you notice our statues, the privileging of human perfectibility, those statues had a particular physical form, right? They were fit, uh, they were uh, ideally musculatured, uh, they had handsome features, the Greek and Roman sharp nose, right? Abs on the torso and so on and so forth. So this idea of the perfect human, right? And this can be traced back all the way to the Enlightenment period or the Renaissance humanism that emerged. So we can see that uh, we have to be a bit mindful that transhumanism is not confused with posthumanism. I have a better example of this. Um, if you'll just bear with me. We can see here uh, uh, a video. I'll, I'll try to play the video. I hope it will be running smoothly. So this video depicts, uh, it's basically about this humanoid robot called Amica. And this has been created by this UK based company called Engineered Arts. So interesting, engineering and arts combined together. And uh, the company says that they are trying to combine AI and AB. So basically artificial intelligence and artificial body. Right, so uh, the video basically was shared with you to emphasize the point that this is not what we're talking about when we uh, think about the human technology relationship uh, when it comes to post-humanism. Uh, robotics, advancement in robotics, especially for entertainment purposes, such as this company has done, uh, this is what uh, let's say transhumanists would say is for the good of mankind, right? Uh, but post-humanism wants to go a little bit deeper into a more philosophical relationship between humanity and technology. And then we also have something called meta-humanism. This is closer to transhumanism as we uh, understand it now. And uh, meta-humanism basically was put forward by these two scholars uh, by the name of Jamie Delval and Stephen Lorenz Sorgner. And they wrote a work called a Meta-Humanist Manifesto. You can find the website. Uh, it was published sometime in 2011. Meta-humanism for them is a critique of uh, the pillars of humanism, what I mentioned uh, with regards to rationality, autonomy, exceptionalism, right? And this is where we'll become closer to what post-humanism is trying to convey. Uh, these pertain to notions of free will, autonomy, and superiority of human beings over the world, over nature, over technology, over animals, right? And they argue that metahumanism deepens the view of the body uh, as, you know, already part of the world. It's not distinct and separate from the world as humanism might try to construct. And I just want to uh, use a quote from them. They say that metahumanism may unfold into endless 
a morphogenesis, right? And they say that monsters, and I'm quoting here, monsters are promising strategies for performing this development away from humanism. Uh, what is interesting in this quote is the use of the word monster because, uh, you know, the word itself sort of is diametrically opposed to what we think of as human, that is non-monstrous, right? So uh, this idea of the monster is being brought back from what monster was trying to show in that drawing, right? The peoples of the world as these fantastic uh, creatures almost combining animal and human and different non-perfect human forms, right? And a more radical kind of post-humanist tradition can be traced back to the 1960s. We had something called the anti-humanist movements, right? Such as Marxism. And the reason these movements began, uh, and I'm simplifying again, generalizing quite a bit, but uh, to make it easier for us to understand, the reason is that uh, there was an attempt, especially during the period of decolonization, right? To reject the Western idea of superiority, especially racial, class, and gender superiority over non-Western cultures or non-Western peoples and beliefs, right? And some aspects of Marxist thought is also thought of as anti-humanist um, because uh, uh, the humanistic conception of life, uh, especially that which came from Europe, it was quite exclusive, right? And this was uh, clearly evidenced during the colonization of the world, uh, that uh, Western modes of thinking, Western knowledge systems, Western art, or what is known as Western civilization was given primacy of place in relation to other parts of the world. And so we have thinkers such as Stefanos Gerulanos, right? He says that humanism can be considered uh, a positivist project, right? And in the same vein, anti-humanism can be a kind of philosophy, a kind of theorization of the human as a construct or a category fundamentally dependent on others. So that exclusive Western idea of art and the human or the Western philosophical tradition, uh, uh, Gerulano says, is actually dependent on the rest of the world, right? So here we have uh, an image uh, uh, to the left of the Vitruvian man it's actually an art piece by this artist called Sarah Valeria, and it's titled, you might have guessed it, Vitruvian Woman, right? And uh, it's a very interesting piece. You can see it. Uh, basically, she used recycled textiles over canvas, and it's multicolored, uh, which kind of sort of challenges the Vitruvian man's, uh, uh, you know, privileged status as the symbol of the Renaissance. Okay. And we also have uh, a very interesting work by this uh, thinker called Mads Rosendahl Thompson. And he wrote this work called The New Human in the Richer, right? And he says that it might not be too difficult to see a greater conflict between thinking about the human as the being which is the most valued in our cultural structures, in our religion, in our laws, and in our philosophy. So this idea of the human sort of is getting displaced from all these categories. And just to quote him, he says, the value of progress supported by the imperfection and sufferings of humanity as it is now constituted are emerging. So we understand that the Western philosophical and scientific uh, uh, way of looking at the world uh, has been challenged of late and needs to be challenged because of the issues uh, that it also brought home along with uh, colonization, decolonization, and now we have neo-imperialism. I hope uh, things are going well so far. Uh, another interesting way to think of post-humanist thought is to link it up to anthropological orientations, basically, you know, anthropology, the study of human beings. And we have this anthropologist by the name of Etienne Balibar, um, who says that we have to start questioning anthropological universals, right? Uh, because the funny thing is, uh, Balibar points out that our anthropological uh, knowledge of humanity comes from separating humanity from nature, right? From the animal world. Uh, but he finds it ironical 
that uh, humanity has only progressed, and this is the quote that he used, uh, humanity has progressed ironically by an animal competition between different degrees of humanity. So he points out that it is our very animal instincts for survival and for domination and for mastery that has been the driving force of conflict. So as we go deeper and in, deeper into this idea of post-humanism, you can see that our place in the world is being brought into question, not to uh, depose us from our position in the world, but sort of to allow us to expand our view of our relationship with other things which are present in the world, right? And this is especially important because uh, of the history of human knowledge in itself, right? The history of human knowledge uh, has depended on, you know, a Western view of knowledge, basically by creating binaries between, say, uh, human and nature, or human and technology. And if you go deeper into it, it's not human anymore, right? It's European man and non-European man, or Western man and non-Western man, or you know, if you uh, attempt a racist criticism. Uh, you can see white man and black man or man and woman. So these binaries, these, these categories, uh, it can be argued, which are driven as distinct, are not as distinct that we expect them to be. So this kind of dualism is being questioned or challenged or to use the word from my title, contested in post-humanist thinking. And we also have something called new materialism, which is very interesting because uh, uh, new materialism sort of tries to bridge the gap between, uh, 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 you know, uh, ideas and matter. So you have thinkers such as Manuel de Landa, uh, Elizabeth Grosch, who are trying to bridge the world of ideality, right? Uh, Plato's understanding that everything has a transcendental root, right? And the world of materiality, the rejection of transcendental thinking. So they're trying to create a post-humanism, which is a little bit in between. It considers both sides of the story. And uh, here I just want to mention a few texts which have helped me uh, over the years trying to grasp uh, all these concepts. We have uh, this work called How We Became Post-Human uh, by N. Catherine Hales. We also have uh, Carrie Wolf, another thinker, who has written What is Post-Humanism? And in India, we also have uh, Pramod Nair there's text, uh, which uh, makes it very accessible for students. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, I have used uh, um, mostly the uh, ideas which have been put forward by this thinker called Francesca Ferrando. And her summation of post-humanism is quite helpful here. So she says that post-humanism attempts at redefining the notion of the human in the 21st century. Fairly simple enough, um, easy to understand. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that sentence warrants, right? And uh, there is one more additional section to this presentation I wanted to add because uh, we are from the English literature background uh, and that is our shared background. So I wanted to borrow this idea of uh, the unnatural narrative, which has been put forward by this uh, narratologist called Jan Alba. Okay, so it is in this phrase, unnatural narrative, that I'll try to I'll attempt to link literature and post-humanism, all right? Uh, that might be an interesting way to think about texts also. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, uh, you know, post-humanist or humanist contestations, uh, you know, that we have seen in these isms that I'm referring to for the purposes of this lecture, just to re-emphasize this tradition uh, and just to think about humanism first, right? The core of the humanities especially in the philosophical tradition of the West, right, uh, is to give the human subject, that is, you know, I and you and me, right, all individuals, it's to give us a sort of privileged position that is, you know, to consider ourselves as autonomous and to consider ourselves as free will or to consider ourselves as rational. And this kind of thinking allows us to project a sense of self onto the world around us, right? And this kind of projection sort of confirms the binaries that we were referring to, that we are distinct, separate, uh, exceptional creatures, different from the animal world, different from nature, different from uh, 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 technology, 
different from other human beings also perhaps. So, and we also feel that this is confirmed in our artistic and linguistic capabilities. We are able to voice languages. We are able to communicate our abstract ideas. Uh, in short, we are able to cast ourselves as a particular dominant in our relationship with the world, right? And you have to remember this world includes not only human others who have been marginalized, let's say in the history of colonization, but it also includes nature, animals, plants, resources, tools, technology, even the act of creativity. This has been attributed to our human free will, autonomy and rationality. So this kind of thinking is the core of the humanities, right? of the liberal humanism that emerged in the humanities till the 1920s. So post-humanism basically says that we have to start questioning our identity as exceptional and transcendental, right? As a philosophical char uh, character, as a philosophical category that is distinct and separate from all these aspects of the world which are mentioned here, right? And this idea of the human, right, that has to be critiqued, this is not something new either. Uh, if we just go back a little bit, even to the late 19th century and early 20th century, we can trace back this anti-humanist quote unquote thinking in the, in, in the works of Nietzsche, for example, or Freud, even Husserl, or even authors such as Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, Samuel Beckett. In fact, Beckett has a quote where he says, uh, where he uses the term post-human with regards to his uh, drama. And later on, we also have figures such as Franz Fanon and Bell Hooks, right? So they started questioning this idea of the human as autonomous or as ex exceptional or as free-willed and uh, you know, as having divine or scientific justification and qualification for mastery over others and the world. And basically, which reserved for this human figure uh, an exclusivity and uniqueness, uh, which is transcendental rather than coming from within, rather than imminent, all right? And uh, this is what many thinkers argue drove, uh, you know, and, and aided systems of exploitation and discrimination. Uh, such as during the colon uh, colonial period, and which continues to drive uh, our differences and our conflicts, such as, you know, which we find in uh, racial differences or gender differences, and in the current uh, neo-imperialistic exploitation of people around the world, especially for resources. And so we have to start sort of uh, rejecting ourselves as exclusive, free-willed, autonomous, and unique. That's what post-humanist thinkers are trying to uh, sort of advocate in their line of thinking. And you have a, a thinker such as Robert Manzoko, for example, and he says that uh, the humanities has placed uh, our human cognition and given it a particular kind of cognitive primacy. And this is what we're starting to uh, sort of challenge that our cognition of ourselves as primary in the world, in our relationship with the world, is not as special as we make it out to be. Um, of course, uh, uh, I just want to clarify also to the students that this does not mean that post-humanism completely rejects humanist ideas, right? And we'll see that these ideas are contested so that a more expanded understanding of the human may emerge. Okay, so post-humanism uh, contests the conceit, if we can call it a conceit, of human exceptionalism. The exclusive idea of humans, uh, the privileged status of humans uh, uh, that has constructed us as aligned to the entitlements of divine right and natural order, right? So basically religion and even science has given us this particular cognitive primacy over the other parts of the world. It is this alleged mastery that post-humanist thought aims to critique and not to destroy the gene genealogy of knowledge. Basically, it's to expand the idea of the human. So just to quote Kerry Wolf, and he says, post-humanism isn't post-human at all in the sense of being after 
our embodiment has been transcended. So he's saying here, post is not an after. It's not a rejection of humanist precepts, but a redefinition. So if we go back to what uh, uh, Dr. Ferrando was saying, it's a redefinition of the human in the 21st century. Um, this idea of disembodiment is also very interesting, especially now, since we are so uh, used to using technology that allows us to explore the digital or virtual spaces, right? Even this uh, lecture, uh, which I'm very lucky to be able to share and to conduct is being done over Zoom, for example. So you're hearing my voice, but it's uh, transmuted in bits, uh, uh, you know, in ones and zeros, uh, uh, traveling a long way in an optical fiber network, right? And so basically, what is happening now is that we think of ourselves as autonomous creatures, but when we participate in this digital plane as a collective, we become less human and more important as a data set. That's the paradox of being human in relation to our digital technologies, right? For example, and Jean Baudrillard had, had a very interesting way of conceiving humanity in relationship to virtual networks. He called us a networked totality, right? We become less free willed, less autonomous, less exceptional uh, when we are in a networked totality, especially in this digital plane, right? So, and this becomes very important if you think about uh, our relationship uh, to each other in this age of viral fake news or big data as they call it and chat GPT recently, right? We are treated as a predictable and stable data set which is very interesting because that sort of contests our idea of rational uh, 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 autonomous thinking. And so uh, we can start to see that there are many non-human processes such as digital processes, which is especially aided by machine learning, for example, which is starting to overtake domains that we have thought uh, is our exclusive and privileged uh, ability and capacity. For example, art, things like writing or composing music or writing poetry, these are now being overtaken by artificial intelligence. So even reason and creativity, what we thought to be exclusively ours is now being overtaken by other thinking uh, capacities. So for example, if we just come to these uh, uh, images, which I'm going to share now, uh, they cast into doubt our relationship with the world and over nature and with animals and with technology. Here we have a recent example. I don't know how many students have watched The Tiger King, uh, but this is Joe Exotic. And recently he announced that he is very interested in also forwarding his name as a nominee for the 2024 US presidential elections. So this will be very interesting. And then we have another example. Uh, this is the artist Neil Harbison and that uh, 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 protrusion you can see coming from his forehead, uh, that is not uh, something done just for style. It's actually implanted in his head. And according to his claims, he was born colorblind. And this device allows his brain to basically sense colors, if not see colors. So in fact, uh, Harbison is legally defined as a cyborg. So this is the kind of post-humanism that we're interested in, not the robots which, uh, uh, with the robot which I was showing you, in the earlier video. And we also have another example of uh, a cyborg, Professor Kevin War Warwick, right? Uh, and he basically implanted a silicon chip in his arm, which allows him to control different devices in his house. So he also has something very interesting. If you uh, search on his website, he has something called Project Cyborg. Uh, that is also, this can be an example of transhumanism. And for us from the literature background, we feel a little bit threatened nowadays because of what is happening with AI being able to write poetry, compose stories. Uh, of course, we can argue about whether these uh, narratives are meaningful or not, uh, but uh, the, the, you know, the ability of AI to create something which we thought was exclusive to human beings, uh, that is very disconcerting at this present moment. So, what would happen if AI overtakes the author, right? So in theory, we already say the author is dead. And now 
it's uh, going to be even more damning for human authors. And of course, you also have uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which learns from its mistakes. So you have these uh, fascinating examples of Deep Blue, for example, which was able to defeat uh, uh, Gary Kasparov in a game of chess. And of course, the most recent example is uh, Google's AlphaGo uh, algorithm, which was able to defeat this Chinese Go champion called KGA. And uh, you can see he's slumped down, uh, feeling quite dejected after his loss. So unaided machine learning is a very, very interesting advancement in technology right now. And uh, this kind of advancement is something that is not fully understood as of now. So post-humanism sort of is drawing attention to our relationship to technology that is self-learning at this stage, that is algorithmic, uh, programmable, but also self-learning. So this kind of technology is challenging what it means to be a thinking human. What if we have thinking machines coming up next, right? Um, we also have a very interesting example, which I wanted to share uh, in terms of our relationship with technology. So nanotechnological robotic interventions, right? Such as we see in this uh, example here, it's called sperm coupling, right? And this has been used uh, as part of uh, experiments in relation to fertility treatments. And I just wanted to share this video. It's uh, self-explanatory. You can see the robot uh, coupling itself to the tail of the spermatozoan. So the robot, uh, one particular nanobot has been able to uh, create a passageway for the sperm in the wall of the egg. Right, so that's a very short uh, example of how nanotechnology is changing even our most intimate of human experiences. Um, you know, where we think we have exclusive domain, which is basically our, our procreative abilities, our reproductive drive, drive, right? So even Freud would have been very fascinated with what's happening here. And so post-humanism is uh, sort of helping us uh, draw our attention to these advancements which are taking place around the world. And it's important to sort of be aware of these advancements and to be able to continually question where we are or where we stand as humanity in relation to these technologies. So despite the apparent human technological divide that exists right now, right? Uh, Post-humanism contests that this divide is something that is insurmountable or which cannot be bridged. Uh, but just to, uh, you know, to think about post-humanist uh, thought in relation to philosophy, I just want to draw attention to uh, one particular thinker, Friedrich Nietzsche, right? And Nietzsche had said, and this is a bit of a lengthy quote, uh, just bear with me. He said, and I quote, no one gives man his qualities. No one gives man his qualities, neither God, nor society, nor his parents and ancestors, nor he himself. No one is responsible for man's being there at all, for his being such and such, or for his being in these circumstances, or in this environment. Man is not the effect of some special purpose of a will and end, nor is he the object of an attempt to attain an ideal of humanity or an ideal of happiness or an ideal of morality. It is absurd to wish to devolve one's essence on some end or other related to humanity, happiness, or morality." End quote. So Nietzsche was trying to question the idealisms which are linked to human progress and to the idea of the human itself. So you can see post-humanist thinking 
can be traced back uh, to ideas propounded by figures such as Nietzsche. And keeping aside uh, his suggestion of a radical kind of reconceptualization of the human, right? Uh, he also makes a point about something he called the vital forces of life. Uh, and this is where it becomes very difficult. If we are indeed questioning uh, human beings and the category of human as we articulate it through language, how do we create a new language? So that's the problem. And one of the ways we can do that is through literature, through creating a new language. That's what Nietzsche was trying to impress upon us. He said that there's something called the vital forces of life itself, which we should take recourse to, art, music, creativity, right? His idea of the overman is sort of this culmination of these vital forces of life. Similarly, we have this uh, philosopher by the name of G. Deleuze, right? And he proposed the idea of uh, the imminent human concept, right? So basically he's saying that uh, uh, the human who was set over nature, over history, over tools, as mentioned earlier, he says that we have to reject this idea of a transcendental human that is over and above all these other categories. And Deleuze created uh, uh, you know, a kind of language which was challenging this idea of the transcendental human. So basically he brought in phrases such as desiring machines or larval selves, right? It's very interesting, his quote. He says, only intensities pass and circulate. Still the body without organs is not a scene, a place, or even a support upon which something comes to pass. In a manner of speaking, an essence is avoided here. It is not particular, rather a degree. So you can see that the, the difficulty which is challenging these philosophers because they're unable to articulate uh, 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 the idea of a new human right? Without creating another set of binaries. That's the paradox of language. Uh, it's very difficult. So they're trying to avoid uh, what is known as essentialist language, language which rests on material evidence. They're using metaphors instead. And that's where post-humanism has a lot of uh, uh, inspiration from literature. Okay. Um, let me just go through this very quickly because I, I might be running short of time. Uh, so these metaphors and the vital forces which Nietzsche was talking about, and of course Deleuze used this uh, phrase called creative acts, all right? Uh, and many of these can be recognized in the process of interpretation that we also partake in as students of literature. And we believe in this idea of a textual fluidity, right? Meaning creation, uh, which is not fixed or absolute in the text itself but in our interpretation. So literature can provide a challenge to cognitive frames. And I just want to come very quickly to our, uh, to an example. I won't uh, dwell too long on these quotations here. Uh, coming back to what Jan Elba said about unnatural or impossible narratives, all right? Um, let me just come to the examples. That will make it a bit more uh, clear for all of us. Uh, Achu, am I good for time? Is it all right? Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, even I... I'm stretching a bit, I, I guess. Uh, but anyhow, uh, maybe another 15 minutes. Um, the Basil is perfectly fine. No need to rush. Do take it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so basically uh, in my uh, lecture, I also wanted to uh, link up post-humanist thought and post-human representations. Uh, and this is where it becomes uh, you know, interesting for us as students of literature. And I wanted to share three examples, all right? Uh, three textual examples. And uh, these are very interesting novels, all right? Um, and, uh, Basically, these three novels, these are three particular examples, which call into question our experience of the world as humans. So our experience of the world is related to uh, temporality, right? to time. Our experience of the world is, re is related to our bodies. So our corporeal experience of the world. 
And our experience of the world is also spatial or physical. So our relationship to spatiality, to the physical world. So these three examples are interesting ways to reconceptualize our relationship to these uh, categories, time, space, and our body. Uh, so this first example is by this author, Martin Amis. And he wrote this novel called Time's Arrow, a very interesting name. And in this novel, we have a character, a doctor by the name of Todd T. Friendly. Uh, and Todd T. Friendly, uh, interestingly, he dies suddenly, all right? It's not explained why he dies, but immediately after he dies, he starts feeling better and he comes alive again, right? And in the process, he starts living his life backward, right? A, a sort of Benjamin Button kind of uh, situation is going on here. But literally, he starts living his life backward. So we have situations, uh, you know, humorous situations where he breaks up with his lovers first and then he proceeds to try to woo them, right? Uh, or because he's a doctor, he uh, uh, inflicts damage and physical wounds upon his patients first before he sends them home. So all the time in the narrative, his life is running backwards, right? So time is literally moving backwards. And Amos is trying to uh, uh, describe this experience of time, which is very difficult if you think about describing your day backward. Imagine starting your uh, day uh, while proceeding to sleep, right? And then going through your dreams and then moving backwards, uh, uh, coming out of the bathroom, uh, getting back into your pajamas and back into bed. So this is the kind of novel that is uh, that we are dealing with here. And so uh, it starts with the main character who has, uh, who basically undies, right? So he's there in the hospital. Uh, he, he's there in the hospital because of a heart attack. And then backwards from there, he becomes an old man puttering about his house and all the way back to his birth. So the narrator, the voice, which is here, the narrative voice becomes a kind of stand-in or substitute for the protagonist uh, who has no power over our, uh, his experience of time in this novel, all right? So if we just take a, a very interesting quote from the novel itself, the protagonist is saying, first I stack the clean plates in the dishwasher. Then you select a soiled dish, collect some scraps from the garbage and settle down for a short wait. Various items get gulped up into my mouth and after skillful massage with tongue and teeth, I transfer them to the plate for additional sculpture with knife and fork and spoon. Next, you face the laborious business of cooling, of reassembly, of storage, before the return of these foodstuffs to the soupret, where admittedly, I am promptly and generously reimbursed for my pains. Right? Very interesting way to think about our relationship to time, completely backwards. He's regurgitating food. Another very fascinating story is this novel uh, by Philip Roth called The Breast, where the main character, uh, just like uh, Gregor Samsa, if you have read The Metamorphosis, right? Uh, uh, the main character here in The Breast, his name is David Kepesh. And suddenly one day he wakes up and he realizes that he has been transformed without explanation into a female breast, right? So what are the implications of this transformation? It's, it's strange, it's uh, horrific, and it's also a little bit funny because it dawns upon him uh, what has happened. So here we have a quote from the novel, a particular scene. I am abreast, uh, uh, you know, the characters informing us, the reader, a phenomenon that has been variously described to me as a massive hormonal influx, an endocrinopathic catastrophe, and or a hermaphroditic explosion of chromosomes. Okay, and here, here's the quote. They tell me that I am now an organism with the general shape of a football or a dirigible. I am said to be of spongy consistency, weighing 155 pounds. Formerly, I was 165 and measuring still six feet in length. Though I continue to retain in damaged and irregular form, much of the cardiovascular and central nervous systems an excretory system described as reduced and primitive, and a respiratory system that terminates just above my midsection into something resembling a navel with a flap, the basic architecture in which these human characteristics are disarranged and buried 
is that of the breast of the mammalian female. Very bizarre uh, description indeed. And the last example is by Angela Carter, this work called The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman. Here we have the main character, Desiderio. Uh, he's an employee in a city which comes under an attack okay, by this character called Dr. Hoffman. And he has mysterious machines which basically can distort or contort uh, physical space. So basically, literally, our physical reality gets distorted if you're in this novelistic world, right? And as the novel progresses, you have these fascinating descriptions of palaces made of clouds. You have pillars that are chanting songs. You have giant heads of conquistadors and you have, uh, you know, giggling chimney pots. So not very strange actually, because this is something we're very used to in cartoons. Um, so our hero actually uh, uh, has fallen in love with a character who only resides in his dreams. So that is where the catch in the novel comes. So uh, Dr. Hoffman's experience of uh, the physical world uh, and his dream world, right? these are collapsed. We don't know which is which. We, as the reader, we're not able to identify which world uh, he's residing in because both worlds are estranged uh, as each other, right? So in this novel, we have the collapse of the physical realities we are used to. And he says, because I am so old and famous, they have told me that I must write down all my memories of the Great War, since after all, I remember everything. So I must gather together all that confusion of experience and arrange it in order, just as it happened, beginning at the beginning. I must unravel my life as if it were so much knitting and pick out from that tangle the single original thread of myself, the self who was a young man, who happened to become a hero and then grew old. First, let me introduce myself. So you can see he's struggling with our understanding of a story, right? How a character, like basically a Bildungsroman, if you will, right? Birth to adulthood to death eventually. So these are a few literary post-human portrayals, right? You can interpret uh, a post-humanist uh, tradition here sort of being championed. Uh, the questioning of our experience of time, the questioning of our experience of our body, the questioning of our experience of physical reality. These are uh, you know, fictional representations, but they also represent our are seeking of an expansion of what it means to be human. It's not enough to be thought of always as an ideal example of rationality or an ideal example of uh, happiness, as Nietzsche was pointing out, or a representation of uh, the divine on earth or a representation of mastery over nature. So these categories where we are placed in a hierarchy with the rest of the world and where we are given a privileged status, this hierarchy is being questioned in novels such as this, right? So these three examples are very interesting. I would encourage the students to pick up these texts if they can. It's very enjoyable to read. And coming to the next part, uh, just to sort of carry on on this thread of uh, explanation, uh, Jan Elba, like the narratologist who was talking about uh, these unnatural narratives, right? He says that uh, uh, novels don't, or fiction rather, does not follow anthropomorphic limitations, right? Our imagination transcends or goes beyond our limitations in our reality, right? So, uh, but we have to be mindful about something. So Albo makes a distinction uh, between, let's say, conventionalized unnatural narratives. And he traces these conventions in narratives which are contained in these kinds of writing. For example, mythological epics uh, or, or beast fables, Aesop's tales, for example, or medieval romances with dragons and uh, kings and knights, right? And Gothic novels or nonsense fiction, science fiction is included here, or even horror, right? And he talks about texts such as we saw just now from Amos and Roth and Carter, he talks about postmodernist unnaturalness, uh, where you have these unconventional uh, sort of 
estranged narratives, which are able to violate our expectations as readers, right? And which undermine the, you know, that primacy, that cognitive primacy that we have with regards to our relationship to the world. So these are what he says. Uh, he says these are representational practices which can challenge or subvert uh, the existing order or expectation in our narrative. Okay. So it's an interesting way to think about post-humanism in relation to literature. So in conclusion, uh, post-humanism basically, it's trying to drive our focus to the certain points which I'm sharing here with regards to our relationship to technology, our networked culture, especially our digital networked culture right now, our sense of animality, uh, you know, the rejection of our of our uh, uh, of our primacy in the natural order, or even our fantasies of disembodiment and autonomy, uh, you know, our experience of virtual reality, for example, is a disembodied experience. Um, uh, but at the same time, this disembodiment, which we're experiencing, let's say, by using uh, uh, virtual reality headgear, it kind of rejects this primacy of the mind over body, right? And so. Uh, there is this drive towards uh, creating uncertainty. And posthumanists say that rather than feeling tense or anxious with regards to this uncertainty, uh, where our self is questioned, we should sort of acknowledge and embrace it, maybe even celebrate it, that's, if that is even possible, right? And of course, in literature, the focus is on unnatural narratives, where we can sort of play around with language in order to create new metaphors of our experiences of the world. So with that, I would like to conclude my lecture. I know I, uh, I sort of had to uh, skip a few things in the middle, but uh, that was more in line with what uh, Jan Elbow was trying to share with regards to unnatural narratives. Um, but I'll be very happy to share this, this presentation with uh, Dr. Achu, and he can also sort of forward it to everyone else. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience, too. Thank you, Dr. Basil, for that enlightening talk and for conveying it in a very succinct and lucid manner. We will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions in the chat box and in the live chat stream on YouTube. Uh, so we have received a question from Professor Cherian Alexander. Shall I read out the question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, yes, please. Could the project of decentering theories of modernity by dismissing them as Eurocentrism be taken too far and end up as valorizing nativism? Could this be used as a pretext by fundamentalists? Uh, uh, yes, so that's a very interesting question. <laughs> uh, at its heart, you're right. Uh, Post humanities traces its uh, 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 you know line of thought to the uh, Eurocentric worldview. That's very right. Um, but uh, to link it up to let's say uh, nativist assertions, uh, uh, it's it's difficult really to categorize it like that. Um, for example, um, the construct of the tribal itself or the native uh, itself has its tribal, uh, itself has its Eurocentric roots, uh, especially uh, coming from the Northeast. Um, I can't uh, uh, talk about other parts, but in the Northeast, we have this very particular way that the tribal has been constructed. And there are currently political assertions which are problematic, yes. And uh, you know we can even sort of say they are xenophobic, they are provincial, they are um, um, uh, downright racist at times. And uh, part of the problem is that uh, this idea of nativism itself has been driven by Western modes of thinking that you know we are privileged as tribal people that we have to. 
uh, adhere to a self-serving isolation or uh, uh, an idea of our place in our uh, in the in the culture of the region, right? And we have started privileging these things. Um, in fact, uh, it's very interesting that uh, in Meghalaya, for example, um, uh, much of the interactions. Uh, with between the Khasi tribe, the tribe to which I belong, and other populations in the region, for example, from Assam or from what is now considered to be Bangladesh, especially the Silhet region, there was a lot of trade and there was a lot of interaction. And even uh, to the extent of, let's say, intermarriage, which used to take place, uh, the Khasis have something called uh, uh, Thangjait, basically creation of new clans, especially through marriage. So this practice was already, uh, you know, a pre-colonial practice. It was with the emergence of uh, the colonialist power in in Meghalaya, right now in Meghalaya, that time Assam, uh, which sort of changed our relationship with these others, and uh, started privileging the Khasi as a figure that has to be culturally isolated or distinct from the other tribes or the other people of the region. So this created, uh, you know, problematic ideas of identity, and this uh, sort of uh, got spread down the generations, became entrenched in our way of thinking, and it's still troubling our relationship with uh, other people in the region, um, which is interesting on the one hand, but also uh, difficult to sort of uh, uh, deal with in the present moment, especially when things are opening up so much so, uh, and there's this. Uh, Reemergence of the need to preserve Khasi cultural identity uh, and traditions, which is again, you know, even this idea of tradition, it's it's so problematic. We can question. So uh, I hope you don't mind. I'm using examples from my own experience of things. Uh, for example, uh, you have uh, a progressive idea such as women's reservation in uh, grassroots political institutions, but uh, the argument from uh, the you know, the tribal view would argue against this and say that it's in our customary tradition not to have women in uh, public institutions or uh, institutions that hold public office, right? So this is a very regressive thinking, but this thinking was actually uh, concretized by the institution of the, the village council, which was given sort of sanctity under the British. So that's the irony of uh, these so-called traditional institutions. Um, so in a way, I hope I'm able to answer your questions. I know, I know I'm digressing a lot, uh, but yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's not so simple as saying that uh, post-humanism is uh, uh, about uh, identifying a Eurocentric worldview and, uh, and sacrificing that uh, for a more nativist or traditional or, you know, sort of homegrown worldview, even that is problematic. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, Darwinism is a humanist concept and has been challenged by various postmodernists. What is its relevance in posthumanism then? Okay, Darwinism, right. Um, So uh, that's uh, that's an interesting way to frame the question. Uh, Postmodernist narratives or, or uh, critiques of Dar Darwinism, right? Um, so posthumanism is not so distinct from, let's say, postmodernist uh, streams of thought. Uh, I think uh, in the examples which I shared, also the texts which I referred to they can be thought of as postmodernist texts, interestingly. I mean, that's what they are thought of generally if you're uh, conducting some kind of uh, interpretation of the text. Um, but Darwinism itself, uh, uh, that has been challenged, right? Uh, for example, the anthropologist who I referred to, Etienne Balibar. So Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest sort of gave rise to, or, you know, sort of uh, uh, encouraged a kind of thinking which uh, allowed for 
constructing identity along the lines of exclusivity, right? Let's say racial uh, 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 ex exclusivity on the one hand, right? So uh, the, uh, the thinking is that, uh, post-humanist thinking is that this kind of uh, exclusivity, which uh, Darwin inadvertently sort of gave rise to, especially when you look at eugenics politics of the uh, early 20th century in places such as Australia or you know, the, the lost generation in Australia with the aboriginals or in South Africa more recently, right? The apartheid regime. Um, uh, you know, these, these large labels that we're using that we are referring to postmodernism or post-humanism by itself, uh, they are interconnected, but they're at the end of the day, just labels at that. So if you go into the particular histories of each uh, uh, culture or each uh, location that we're trying to identify in our studies, they'll all have very interesting intersections with the colonial power, which is uh, like uh, 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 Sir had previously asked in his question, which he was hinting at, that it's not easy to categorize as black and white, right? So even if there is a critique, uh, which can be identified in, uh, let's say, under the label of postmodernism, of let's say uh, Darwin's uh, theory of, you know, our evolution and uh, the justification of man's evolution uh, in on a scientific uh, basis. Uh, Posthumanism is not very different from that, uh, as such, right? Uh, but the idea is to philosophically challenge the claim that such evolution is natural. That is where uh, things become problematic, especially with the advent of technology, where evolution is sort of now in our hands also. If you look at uh, reproductive technologies or gene splicing or genome editing technologies such as CRISPR that have emerged. Uh, so post-humanism sort of extends the postmodernist critique a little bit more towards technology rather than just language articulation. So it's not no longer just a problem of articulation. It's also now a, a very real problem of technology overcoming uh, our definition of what it means. Thank to you, be. sir. Uh, yeah. So we have a question from Ms. Purnima. Dust thou art and unto dust shall thou return, says the Bible. Will the future of post-humanism try to mar this theological perception of life? Uh, <laughs> that's also a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, I, and this is a very personal opinion. Unfortunately, I think no. In fact, uh, you know, movements such as transhumanism uh, actually uh, uh, sort of position themselves as new theologies of humanity, uh, which is very interesting. So you have like, let's say the Church of Scientology, uh, which uh, very much, propounds the idea that uh, the human technology interface is unquestionably good for all of humanity. So you have this embracing of technologies that further enhance uh, the idea of the human. So if, if that's the case, then uh, the biblical human, right? Although sinful, although fallen in a state of original sin, right? Uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, and this is something which is not new. If you go back, let's say, even to when English literature first started emerging as a subject, uh, you have F.D. Maurice, for example, right? He was the teacher at King's College, and he was a big proponent of something called uh, Christian socialism, right? Uh, uh, thinking about humanity's good. And transhumanism uh, sort of propounds this, the same thing. The idea that uh, you can have a new theology based on technology and which can sort of bring the human figure closer to the divine. So um, I don't know whether there are churches which are suspicious of technology as much as we would like them to be right now. Uh, and if you look at, let's say, uh, progressive thinking with regards to rights and entitlements in our relationship to technology, uh, the church is still very conservative, especially um, uh, you know, the major Christian denominations 
you can just look at the debates uh, in the US with regards to abortion or with regards to cloning, right? So perhaps in that sense, yes, uh, a new theology cannot be found, which is ideally Christian in its conservative or orthodox sense. But at the same time, you have new denominations which are embracing this idea of a new theology based on technology. Is that making sense? Thank you, sir. Do we have any more questions? We have one more. Ashwari, I'll send it to you. Okay, ma'am. We have a question from Ms. Aradhana. Transcending from humanism to post-humanism, will the moral hierarchy of placing man at the top continue? Thank you for the question. Um, broadly speaking, yes. <laughs> I, I don't see how even post-humanism can sort of usurp the figure of uh, the human um, in relationship to everything else. In fact, uh, 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 just uh, returning to one section of the lecture uh, where you had, uh, you know, uh, this uh, post-humanist thinker, uh, Francesco Ferrando, and she herself says that uh, this redefinition does not mean that uh, we are sort of toppling uh, our position in relationship to the world, but uh, we're trying to expand our definition of what it means to be human. So uh, that's why even in the humanities now, you have very interesting uh, disciplines which are uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, ways of thinking which are emerging, uh, the medical humanities, or uh, if you look at eco-critical perspectives or uh, you know, bioethics, these are all important ways of sort of uh, refiguring our relationship to things like nature or to animals or to technology. Uh, but we are not displaced, I would say. We're not completely displaced. It's only, interestingly, it's only in our representation in art and literature, which Nietzsche and uh, Deleuze were referring to, right? These creative forces, these vital forces, that is where we can challenge our privileged position that is uh, there. Uh, we don't have to adhere to a particular uh, desire to have mastery over others or over the world as such. So that is where perhaps there can be a little bit of a challenge mounted. But generally speaking, I don't see how we can be sort of, in fact, many post-humanists say that we are just continuing the humanist traditions uh, uh, in our ways of thinking. Nothing has really changed because, uh, and the inverse is also true. There are many thinkers who are identifying that uh, this anti-humanist conception or the idea of the human as uh, uh, you know not perfect or not ideal, this was already embedded in our cultures. So it's something we're already used to. If you just think of uh, our own, uh, storytelling uh, cultures, you know, like for example, uh, the Jataka tales uh, from so many hundreds of years ago, this collection of stories about the different bodhisattvas, right? And they emerged in different forms. They emerge as trees, they emerge as animals, as, uh, as parts of nature. And this relationship was taken as a given, uh, as taken for granted, it was never challenged, right? So, even in the West, what is being seen as post-humanist thinking, in our orientation, it's not so strange. Uh, if you just look at our religions and our cultures, it's not very strange. Even here in the Northeast, there are a lot of oral stories about were tigers and uh, uh, you know, men and women who are brothers and sisters with animals and who could speak and converse with nature and uh, elements from nature, objects, rocks and trees and hills. Um, and snakes and birds and tigers, right? So these stories have uh, sort of demystified post-humanism for us already. Uh, where it is uh, relevant, I might, uh, uh, for me personally, I think is in its critique of our digital cultures. Um, you know, this uh, point which Baudrillard was trying to make about networked totality, where 
we, as, as we have emerged, let's say on spaces and platforms such as social media, where we think we are unique or where we think our, uh, you know, our creativity is uniquely expressed, right? In a post or in a photograph. Actually, uh, when each data, uh, each user generated data is taken as a collective, uh, as a totality, and it's, uh, you know, it's looked at as a set of data. We are strangely very, very, uh, uh, you know, similar. So we can be categorized very easily. That's why you might have found it strange to get such targeted advertisement sent directly to you, right? And you might think there's a conspiracy of foot that, oh, I spoke with my friend over the phone and the computer is listening, the company is listening and so on and so forth. That's, that's how we dismiss it. But actually it's just algorithms that are understanding our behavior. So user behavior uh, scaled up, uh, especially with regards to big data is very easily uh, interpretable. So we're not that unique. And so it's important to uh, sort of approach our relationship to these new technologies a bit cautiously so that we don't sacrifice, forget autonomy, we don't sacrifice our privacy, for example. Now there's a huge concern with regards to data privacy, and we don't know where we stand at this present moment, uh, legally speaking, or even morally speaking. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I again <laughs> digressed quite a bit. I apologize. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have received a comment and a question from Dr. Arul. I enjoyed listening to the presentation. Congratulations on a very interesting trajectory from theory to fiction. So I would like to ask the question, would it be possible to see post-humanism as an algorithm induced quietism, which perhaps, which perhaps skips tough questions about labor, money, and desire as famous of human experience? Uh, thank you, Dr. Arul, for your encouragement and your kind words. Uh, could you please uh, kindly repeat the second part of the question? As desire, labor, uh, yes, money? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I shall repeat the question. Would it be possible to see post-humanism as an algorithm-induced quietism, which perhaps skips tough questions about labor, money, and desire as framers of human experience? Correct, uh, Dr. Arun. Very true. Uh, indeed, I think that is what's happening also. You're very right. Uh, in fact, one of the most uh, uh, interesting works which came out recently uh, with, in relation to post-humanism is something called Renaissance post-humanism. And the focus has shifted uh, to, uh, you know, um, basically the domains of art and creativity. So it's moving, it is moving away from questions of let's say uh, class uh, and gender. Um, already this trajectory is sort of uh, coming to the fore. And part of the problem I think is that uh, uh, the, there has been a sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's imperceptible at times, but there has been a shift in ideology of late. And one of the shifts which is profound is that uh, the political process is no longer, uh, you know, uh, arguing along, along the lines of ideology, right? So you have uh, questions of labor, for example, or desire sort of being subdu subsumed into larger uh, issues with regards to uh, nationhood and identity. And that sort of, yes, you're right. It's sort of, uh, you know, uh, the voice, that is accorded to these issues, it becomes sort of silenced in the face of a larger, more pressing voice with regards to uh, the place of uh, human beings in the world in general. So these specificities and these intersectionalities are being sort of ignored. You're absolutely right. I, I can see that also. Um, in the works which I've been reading of late, uh, how post-humanism is also sort of, as an academic category is shifting slowly. And that is a problem. Okay. And perhaps revisiting it in the anti-humanist tradition uh, under Marxism, that would be very interesting too. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. We have received one more question from Ms. Samantha. Transcending from humanist. So we have received one more question from yeah. Ms. Samantha. Can yeah. we consider yeah. time as an assemblage and how can it be discussed in the area of techno fantasies and post-human? Uh, did I hear that right? Can we consider time uh, as I shall it again? Can we consider time as an assemblage and how can it be discussed in the area of techno fantasies and post-human? Okay, uh, that's a yeah, that's a dense question. Dense question. Assemblage as an assemblage theory. Is that Dilanda's notion? I, I'm just wondering. I'll just take it as that. Um uh, yes, I mean, uh, because assemblage uh, conceptions of uh, experience also sort of consider uh, experience as fluidity, right? Uh, as a fluid thing, as related to many conditionalities. So time in itself, uh, um, you know, if we, I mean, we have to be a bit careful about where we position ourselves in relation to this thing called time. Are we trying to position ourselves in the literary or narrative stick sense? So in that sense, it's already quite fluid. Uh, but if you want to position it as part of, let's say, a social and material network, uh, which Dilanda was trying to do, then uh, it becomes a bit more difficult because uh, again, I'll agree with the previous uh, uh, question that if we start to ignore the particularities of history or the specifics of historical experience uh, in favor of, let's say, fluid constructs of our experience of time or history, right? We sort of ignore more pressing issues which, uh, uh, which concern us. Uh, for example, let's say, uh, with regards to labor, as Sir very rightly pointed out, um, or with regards to desire or gender, for example. So, um, it's important to think of uh, uh, time or its relationship to history as not very easily exchangeable, right? Questionable, yes, but it should not be so fluid. You have to uh, look at history, challenge that position as the first uh, question was trying to do, Eurocentric versus nativist, right? And see whether you can create intersections which problematize both categories, right? Um, I don't know about the philosophical experience of time, uh, like let's say, with regards to Bergson and others, uh, I can't comment too much on that. Um, but uh, yes, techno fantasies and post-human. Um, time as part of a techno fantasy landscape, yes, it can very much be uh, uh, sort of connected uh, because the representation of time itself in uh, fiction, uh, you know, it, it takes on many forms and it narrates many different experiences. Uh, but I don't know how uh, that might be thought of as an assemblage. Rather than thinking of it as that, maybe uh, it can be just linked directly to narratological aspects, such as, such as you know, flash forwards and flashbacks, something more particularly uh, related to literature, rather than let's say theory uh, at this stage. Is that making sense? I hope. Thank you, sir. We have our last question from Dr. Mini. Isn't there a paradox between we are creating and destroying at the same time? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's a, a beautifully expressed question. We are creating and destroying at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, button holds us in the laws of thermodynamics, right? Uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, yes, uh, uh, um, it's, it's uh, actually the new materialist way of thinking sort of wants to reconcile these differences, right? Uh, especially if you trace it back, like Western uh, knowledge traditions 
and Western philosophy is rooted in this idea of the I, which you know sort of emanated from uh, Rene Descartes' statement. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, therefore, there was this assumption that perhaps the mind is being privileged over the body, and especially if you complicate it uh, by referring back to Christian notions of purity and sin, the body is indeed already sinful. And we have to remember that Kat was, uh, you know, trying to reconcile this idea of sin also and the body, right, with the notion of the I. So the separation of the mind and the body, the dualism which came about, uh, sort of, uh, it was in favor of uh, a metaphysics which was very Eurocentric, coming back to the first question. Um, and this sort of led uh, the, uh, the European worldview in terms of its trajectory in the period of colonization, this privileging of the mind over matter and over the body. And this dualism is now being challenged, right? That our disembodied understanding of the self, it's not so unaffected by our bodily experiences. Um, so yes, this is the paradox that uh, the mind depends on the body and as so does the body in the states of affectations from the environment, from assemblages as uh, the student or the, the, quest, the previous question was referring to. And uh, uh, yes, uh, in that sense, it, it's a very philosophical comment or question we're creating as well as destroying at the same time. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with that, uh, but yes, uh, Elizabeth Grosh would say we have to sort of reconcile these ideas, uh, these paradoxes, rather than trying to uh, sort of categorize them as distinct and absolute, exclusively uh, reserved uh, items. I hope that uh, also makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have received a comment from Minima. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Do we have any more questions? Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. All right. All right. That means you've come to the end. Thank you so much, sir, for patiently answering all our queries. We have come to the end of a wonderfully informative day one of our online plenary. Once again, on behalf of the Department of English, I would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Basil for accepting our invite to be our guest speaker and for an insightful session. Thank you everyone. We appreciate all for being here for the entire session and making our day one a success. I would like to make a gentle reminder about tomorrow's online plenary on restoring memory, and we'll have with us Ms. Nina Sarnani, an artist come storyteller, as our guest speaker for day two. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you all again tomorrow at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Basil. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ashwarya, for uh, your moderation of the session. Thank you everyone for your really insightful questions. I also have a lot of uh, thinking to do and rethinking to do to, uh, you know, when I think about the questions that were asked. Uh, again, I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity and this experience, and hopefully we'll get a chance to interact again someday. Uh, good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bethel.